Okay, so um, I think we're ready to start the second half of the symposium. Um, and I'm just going to introduce uh, myself and, and talk about, a little bit about the project. And then I'll give a paper and then there'll be a panel discussion with uh, Stephanie Bird and Rose Boyd. So I'll, I'll tell you about them in a minute. So um, we're really delighted to be here. We're very grateful to Jordan who has basically put on this event. We're kind of um, piggybacking off of his event, but an excellent event it has been. Um, and we hope that we can contribute something different um, that, that kind of explores shame at the more conceptual dimension, uh, in, in a more conceptual way, um, but that still kind of touches on the themes that have been raised in, in the discussion in the morning session. Okay, so um, I'm from the Fringe Centre, and it's as a member of the Fringe Centre that I am here. Um, so the Fringe Centre is UCL's Centre for the Study of Social and Cultural Complexity, um, and we're, we're pairing with Jordan to do this, uh, put on this particular event. So I want to start by kind of giving the floor over to Peter, who will uh, tell you a little bit about the Fringe Centre, what it is that we do, and why it is that we're slightly different to some of the other centres at UCL. And then I'll be given a paper which is kind of very boring and <laughs> dense, <laughs> which is going to be followed by an excellent panel by um, Stephanie Bird, who's um, the Professor of German at UCL. Um, she's also the Director of SELF. Um, oh no, sorry, CMM CMII. Both. Oh my goodness, she's incredible. Um, so she's gonna <laughs> she's gonna give a paper. Um, kind of critiquing the idea that shame is a moral emotion, which is something you find, you know, that's quite dominant theoretically in, in theoretical discussions of shame, the idea that shame is moralising or has some kind of special moral significance, so she's going to be critiquing that. And then uh, Rose, who's not yet here, but is on her way, I'm assured, will, who's a, a novelist, she's going to um, give a piece that she's written, for, especially for today, on shame and um, her, her experiences of it, in relation to the um, Me Too campaign as well, so it, it touches on that as well. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to hand over to Pete in the first instance. Pete, who will tell you a little bit about Fringe. Thanks so much, Akosa. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you to Jordan and to UAL for uh, allowing us to take part in this. It's really been a great morning, um, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Um, you know, normally when I'm introducing the Fringe Center at UCL or at academic um, events, I'm aware that we're sort of the unconventional people. Right now, I feel so bourgeois. I cannot tell you. Um, Anyway, moving right along, the Fringe Center. Um, Fringe is an acronym, and we're gonna play a little video that's short that will sort of act out the acronym. It stands for fluidity, resistance, invisibility, neutrality, gray zones, and elusiveness. And basically what we're interested in is trying to find ways to think about things that don't fit normal academic categories of how we think about things. Um, it was founded um, by uh, our colleague, Alena Ledenova, who's a professor at the School of uh, Slavonic and East European Studies, where I'm also based at UCL. And it may sound like a slightly strange place for an institute like this to emerge, but it emerged from our interest in trying to rethink the idea of <coughs> area studies, which some of you may know, I mean, the, in the old days, area studies was about expertise in a particular area. Um, CIS, School of Salonic and East European Studies, was sort of uh, a machine for generating experts in the Soviet Union who would then uh, advise the government and, and things like that. And um, we realized quite some time ago that this was a very outdated model. And we wanted to think about just the ways that you know, thinking about area studies as a way of thinking about embedded practices as opposed to theoretical or conceptual ways of thinking about practices. And so our interest is in the way that things change or become complicated, elusive, ambiguous when they happen in the real world. So that's what the Fringe Center is about. And we sort of have taken up this idea of area studies without borders meaning area studies without any particular area. Um, and that's what Fringe is a venue for. So um, we certainly don't have any specific mandate or a subject matter that we concentrate on, but we look for projects 
um, and cooperate collaborators who are interested in thinking about things in the way that we like to think about things. Okay, so now I'm going to play this little video. I think. Over, mostly over at UCL. We'd love to have people come and attend them. If you're interested, we'll, we'll have some uh, flyers in the, uh, in the, at the reception. Oh. Stop. <laughs> we'll have some flyers over at the reception, um, and those have information of how you can sign up to our newsletter and get information about our events. Um, and we'd love to see you at some of our upcoming events. We have a, a book launch coming up in late March, which is going to be so much more than a book launch, um, which is celebrating our, our first publication because we have a, a book series with UCL Press, the Fringe series. And we've just published a massive two-volume encyclopedia of informality that was edited by Aliona Ledenova. And we're going to have a book launch uh, that I think will be really a fun and interesting event um, and that's our next upcoming event. So I encourage you all to sort of look us up um, and come to any events you're interested in. Um, great, and that's all I have to say. So I will pass the sort of symbolic microphone over to Akosha. Okay, <laughs> thank you. So that's the promotional bit done. We are really very interesting and you should find out more about us. Um, okay, so I'm gonna give a paper that's quite academic and a little bit dry, but I think I'm going to try and tease out some of the themes from the morning and kind of make it relatable to some of the things that we've been discussing. So basically, um, my idea, in the, I'm, I'm doing a PhD at UCL in the philosophy department, and my, uh, my thesis, that's the one, my thesis is on shame. And basically, my idea is that shame is a social in a very distinctive kind of way, and shame is the kind of emotion that emerges uh, you know, through childhood, through, um, through our desire to kind of have a kind of a rapport with people. So shame is the experience that you have when there is a violation of kind of a communicative engagement with, with someone and a communicative engagement of a particular kind, right? So communicative engagement that makes you feel secure or makes you feel that you are attended to, that you are loved, that you are safe and that sort of thing. So what happens when that engagement is fractured is kind of the, the genesis of the shame experience. As you get older, it kind of it complex, it gets more complex in various ways. You add various cognitions to it. You add various kind of like um, norms to it. But I think the core remains the same. It's this kind of this experience that you have when you have this fracture, when you have this breakdown of this kind of uh, bond of kind of accord with people. So this is uh, a little bit about that. And I think if I go on for over 20 minutes, we just, we just start. Uh, we just have questions on what we have been able to do. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> it has the hugely pretentious title of the psychological ontogenesis of the shame experience. Yeah. Can you not hear me? No. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, OK. I can, I can use the mic. It just it's Hello, is that better? Okay. <laughs> Not musician. Um, okay. All right, okay. <clears throat> Let's speak in a third person. Okay, the aim is to give an account of the still face experiment from which we can identify the experiences out of which shame emerges and the psychological structures that underpin that experience. I will suggest 
that the psychological structures that underwrite shame's experiential precursor are best understood as an awareness of the absence of matching behaviors. Matching behavior is a distinctive form of interpersonal communication whose desirability is grounded in our natures as social animals. When we become aware of the absence of such behaviors, we become aware of a failure of interpersonal communication, which we respond to with negative affect followed by gaze aversion. It is this negative affect that will be identified as the experiential precursor to shame. The experience out of which shame emerges and the underlying psychological structures will be referred to as shame's originating conditions. The discussion of shame's originating conditions will give us a new perspective from which we can evaluate shame's relationship to social and moral values. So it's boring, right? <laughs> but th there are some interesting parts. Okay, so the characterization of shame's originating conditions presented here stems from experiments in developmental psychology showcasing the remarkably high levels of emotional competence of pre-linguistic infants. Following affect theorists like Tompkins and Nathanson, the argument assumes that shame-like experiences are marked by negative affect accompanied by some among a range of basic expressive behaviours associated with the shame. So they include gaze aversion, slumped posture and blushing. These expressive behaviours are basic in the sense that they are unlearned reactions that can be displayed from birth. To mark a distinction between shame-like experiences picked out by this sparse criteria and experience of shame as we understand it, which has a far richer engagement with cognition and culture, I'll refer to them as shame star. So basically I'm talking about shame experienced by children, very young children in some cases, and the idea is that you know, shame doesn't come out of nowhere, right? It's something that builds psychological structures that enable us to experience it, build over time. So I'm trying to give an account of this kind of, the, the experience you have, your younger self might have, and kind of uh, propose something about the relationship between that, this younger self kind of shame and, and older shame, okay? But so it's basically about this younger kind of, uh, more naive, uh, less conceptual, not more naive, but less conceptual kind of experience. So it doesn't have the kind of the complexity of the social dimension just yet. Okay. <clears throat> Outside of affect theory, but still within the field of developmental psychology, the experiments and emotional competence of infants appealed to here derives from work uh, from the work of Tronick, Stern, and more recently Brochat and Nagy. It must be admitted that these theories take themselves to be investigating the emotional lives of infants very generally, and do not see themselves as talking about shame specifically. Nevertheless, on the supposition that shame-like experiences can be marked in the way above described, so negative affect plus these kind of expressive behaviors, uh, research into the emotional development of infants can be invoked to show that children as young as three months old experience shame star, the, the basic child shame thing, uh, when reciprocal interaction or effective engagement with the caregiver becomes impaired. <coughs> so, <coughs> Tronic in the late, late 80s he observed that in ordinary cases of infant-mother interaction, the infant expresses a desire to engage with the mother through facial expressions, gestures, and vocalizations. For example, the child might smile, look into the face of the mother, gargle contentedly, and raise out her arms. <laughs> Each, they do this, right? Each of these behaviors is a communicative gesture that is designed to elicit a response from the mother. Typically, the mother will pick up on these cues and reciprocate using an array of behaviours, vocalisations and facial expressions that signal affective engagement with the child and a willingness to help. Through these affectionate responses or reciprocal positive exchanges, the infant succeeds in positively engaging with the mother and derives satisfaction and pleasure as a result of the reciprocal interaction. So as a means of testing the emotional competence of infants, Tronic manipulated the ordinary infant care carer interaction in various ways. In the experiments that will be our focus here, the mother begins by interacting in the usual way with the child. After a few minutes, the mother is instructed to cease engagement with the child and to remain expressively neutral in the face of the infant's attempts to elicit engagement. That is to say, the infant behaves in a way, behaves in ways designed to elicit the reciprocal positive exchange that is present in ordinary interactions. However, the mother does not reciprocate. The mother looks at the child expressionless or blankly. Uh, she looks away from the child. She doesn't talk. The infant's not held, smiles, and not returned. Tronic noted that the immediate response of the infant to these unresponsive behaviors is to continue in attempts to engage with the mother. But after a short period, as failure persists, often as a matter of seconds, the infant reacts by showing signs of negative affect, 
So that's evidenced by the distressed face and by crying, and they, they turn away. These reactions persist for a long time after the caregiver, sorry, these reactions persist for some time after the caregiver is instructed to resume normal interactions with the child, suggesting that the distressing effect of the interactive breakdown reduces the child's ability to engage into the immediate future. So like, when the, the mother doesn't engage in the way that is usual, in the way that kind of establishes a positive kind of accord, the infant gets distressed, they turn away. But even as the mother kind of resumes that interaction, the, the infant remains distressed for a period of time. So this breakdown has some sort of long-term, not a long-term effect, but it persists beyond the actual experience. Okay, the response observed by Tronic to, oh, okay, the response observed by Tronic yeah. to what is now known as the still face experiment has been so widely reproduced that it has become a canonical feature of introductory textbooks to the emotional, on the emotional competence of infants. The basic model for the still face experiment involves one, Interactions between a postnatal infant and adult, followed by two, a disruption uh, in which the adult becomes unresponsive and displays an emotionally neutral or still face, and finally three, the resumption of res responsive interaction. So utilising this model, Nagy, and this was in 2008, worked with newborns hours after birth and recorded their engagements with an experimenter rather than, as is usual in such experiments, with a primary caregiver. So remarkably, the, remote, the results were exactly as Tronic had reported 20 years prior. That is to say, even in the case of newborn babies interacting with strangers, when interaction shifts from being affectionate, responsive, and reciprocal, as in the first phase, to being unresponsive uh, and unaffectionate, which is the second phase, newborns, to a degree that was statistically relevant, displayed signs of negative affect and significantly discreet and significantly decreased eye contact with their interactive partner. So furthermore, Nagy observed that the infant's reaction to this disruption engagement persisted for a time even after the adult had resumed normal engagement, adding weight to the idea that these breakdowns negatively affect the child's ability to positively engage into the immediate future. Okay, so we're on to part two. <clears throat> okay. To begin to understand why pre-linguistic infants react as they do to the still face experiment, it's useful to reflect on Tronic's distinction between other and self-directed regulatory behaviours. Okay. Other directed regulatory behaviours are behaviours used by the infant to get others to assist them to achieve their goals. If the goal is social interaction, for example, the infant can look directly at the caregiver, smile, extend their arms and so on. The function of these behaviours is to elicit a response from the caregiver that will assist the child to achieve their goals and consequently to avoid distress caused by failure to attain their goals. If we think of other directed behaviours as ones that aim to solicit help from others to prevent distress caused by goal frustration, then self-directed true behaviours are ones the child has available to themselves to prevent distress caused by having a goal frustrated. Self-directed behaviours include looking away and thumb sucking. Okay. So basically, Tronic makes this distinction between other directed and uh, self-directed regulatory behavior. So other directed be regulatory behaviors are things that the child does to get the adult or to get the interactive partner to do certain things to assist the child's goals in various ways. And that may be successful or not. If it's not successful, they get distressed. If it's successful, they're happy, right? But then you have these self-directed uh, regulatory behaviors. And these are behaviors that the child has of themselves that don't depend at all on other people to comfort them when their goals aren't, aren't met, right? So when whatever it is that they want to do, it's not met for whatever reason. So they're things like sucking their thumb, self-soothing <coughs> behaviors that the child has available to them uh, to kind of combat the distress caused by whatever it is, you know, the goal that's frustrated, right? <coughs> okay. There are elements both in the characterization of self directed regulatory behaviours and other directed regulatory behaviours that we should attend to if we wish to understand the infant's response to the still face experiment. In the category of self-directed regulatory behaviours, the function of gaze aversion is the most important to underscore. So Tronic writes, these behaviours control the infant's negative affect by shifting his or her attention away from a disturbing event or substituting positive negative simulation. For example, looking away reduces the infant's heart rate during stress, and thumb sucking can calm, can calm a distressed infant. 
So looking away in distressing context has consistently been shown to reduce automatic arousal and negative affect. It slows down your heart rate effectively if you look away from something that's painful. And that kind of makes you feel a little bit better. Gaze aversion in distressing context effectively calms us down and presumably for the reasons that Tronic identifies, it shifts attention away from the distressing event. So we know this, in, okay. <clears throat> the function of gaze aversion and indeed the other self-directed registry behaviors therefore gives us information about the temporal ordering of the infant's reaction to the still face experiment. <laughs> Rather than describing the infant's reaction as negative affect plus gaze aversion as we've been doing so far, we can now see that the infant moves from an awareness of this disruption through to the negative affect, which is marked by the distressed face and crying, and then to gaze aversion and other self-comforting behaviors, which is to say, gaze aversion is a response to the negative affect, which is in itself a response to an awareness of the radical disruption interaction experienced by the infant. Tronic's characterization of other directed registry behaviors provides insight into the infant's reaction to the still face experiment insofar as it directs our attention to the importance of reciprocity. Okay. However, the goal-orientated focus of other directive regulatory behaviours is liable to mislead by, by obscuring the significance of the affective dimension of the communicative exchange. In order to clearly underscore the importance of affect, we will introduce a distinction between mirroring and matching behaviours. Both mirroring and matching behaviours are communicative acts performed by one person A in response to the communicative acts of another person B. When the infant reaches out his arms, the matching behavior is to pick them up. The mirroring response would be to hold out one's own arms. The matching response therefore involves the ability to detect and react appropriately to another's communicative gestures. So sometimes the matching response might involve mirroring. So for example, when a child signals a desire for interaction with smiles, the matching response would involve smiling back as well as other gestures that signal to the child that one is willing and ready to be, you know, to, to engage. Okay. Unlike other directed regulatory behaviors whose significance for the infants appears to lie in soliciting help from others to further their own goals, the significance of matching behaviors for the individual whose behaviors are successfully matched is in what is effectively communicated. Matching responses consist in a range of behaviors that may or may not include sensible speech acts or, instruments be or instrumental behaviors that advance others' goals, but they collectively let the child or let the other know uh, that we are, they collectively let us know that we are recognized as being objects of concern and of interest. For the individual whose behaviors are successfully matched, matching behaviors establishes feelings of security and kinship with the matched other. More generally, matching behaviors collectively constitute a bond of accord, a bond of accord, of mutual recognition, and of sympathetic, sympathetic engagement between two people. Thus, the significance of matching behaviors for the individual whose communicative acts are successfully matched is or is primarily affective. This is not to deny that A's matching B's behavior might, in some cases, include or even require A to behave in ways that advance one of B's goals. The point is rather to allow for the possibility that A can fail to match B's behaviors, even if she succeeds in advancing B's goals. Okay, we will offer a complete characterization of matching behaviors in chapter. Okay, so <clears throat> when Tronic is trying to understand an infant's reaction to these particular experiments, okay, he says what's going on is the adult isn't, uh, you know, she, the adult isn't helping the child to get to their goals. Okay, so the goal is going to be social interaction or whatever the goal is. So say that the child wants a, a cup, you know, they're reaching out. They see what the, the child, you know, the adult doesn't reciprocate, doesn't respond, doesn't uh, assist the child in this goal. The child gets upset, they get distressed. They turn away, this kind of like this shame star, they experience the shame star. So for him, it seems to be that the most important thing is, is helping the child to achieve a goal, right? And I think that that, that can be right in some cases, but I think that obscures the significance of this interaction, right? So the point isn't that you haven't helped the child to advance the goals. The point is that you have uh, frustrated this communicative exchange, and you see that in, in adult experiences. So for example, if you're upset with your partner, you might you know, still cook them dinner, but the, the manner in which you do it, right? you kind of 
throw the play, you know, you, the, the way that you kind of enact that behavior, it's not the fact that you haven't advanced their goal. You've advanced their goal, you've given them dinner, that's like their goal. But the way that you do it suggests it, it will be su sufficient, right, in many cases, for that, you know, for the partner to be distressed and, and you know, experience shame as a result of it. So the, the point isn't that a goal has been advanced or frustrated. The point is that is in what is communicated, right? In what is communicated in your interaction, okay? Irrespective of what the actual interaction is, like what does it communicate? Does it make the child or does it make the other feel kind of secure and attended to and loved? Or does it make them feel, you know, that something's gone wrong, right? Something's gone wrong, they can't, you know, f figure out why. Um, so the point of that section basically is to say, it's not the goal that's the issue, that is primary. It's not the goal that's primary. In some cases, you know, it involves kind of goal frustration, but that's not the point. The point is what you communicate in the, in the manner in which you engage with other people, right? So that's the point. So that's the point of that section. And you can skip that bit. Yeah, we can skip that because it just gets technical and I've just explained what it is and what the point is here. So. What's the time? It's uh, two. Huh? Two. <laughs> okay. Okay. We return. Okay. So I do have to control it. Tronic's characterization. <coughs> okay. Tronic's characterization of other directed but true behaviors encourage us to locate the source of the infant's negative affect and the failure of the caregiver to, to assist the infant in the goal of interaction. In contrast, we locate the source of the, negative of the negative affect in what is affectively communicated by the lack of reciprocal engagement, namely that one is not recognized as being an object of concern or interest for the other. As matching behaviors can include behaviors that advance the goals of the individual whose behavior is matched, the difference between our account and the difference between our account of the source of the infant's negative affect and Tronic's own account is a matter of emphasis driven by divergent aims. Okay. So Tronic's aim, uh, Tronic aims towards an account of the infant's reaction to the still face experiment so as to better understand the emotional competence of infants generally, whereas we aim to explain the infant's reaction in such a way as to teach us something about shape. So focusing on the presence, I've just jumped a bit, focusing on the presence or absence of matching <coughs> behaviours helps to advance our understanding of the infant's reaction to the still face experiment by bringing into view the content of the infant's awareness. The infant becomes aware of a breakdown in matching responses from the caregiver. It also helps us to understand the source of the negative affect. The infant experiences a negative affect because of what the breakdown in matching behaviours effectively communicates to them. Conjoining these points with our previous observations about the function of gaze version, we can provide a basic framework for the understanding of the infant's response in the still face experiment. The idea is that the infant becomes aware of a breakdown of matching behaviors with the caregiver or the experimenter, which affectively communicates to her that she is no longer the object of concern or interest. Okay. She responds to this awareness with a negative affect, that is followed by gaze version. Uh, the gaze version being an attempt by the infant to self-comfort by diverting attention away from the situation that causes the, the negative affect in the first place. Yeah? Section four. Okay. <clears throat> we turn our focus more generally now to the negative affect experience as a result of a detection of a breakdown in matching behaviours. We will suggest that awareness of a breakdown in matching behaviours is intrinsically distressing and we will advance criteria for arriving at a positive characterization of the phenomenology of this distressing affect that does not depend on verbal reports. So not being matched is intrinsically problematic. It's just gonna hurt you, like, just because of the kinds of creatures that we are. Um, and I wanna give a characterization of this kind of, this negative affect, this distress that the, that the child has. Um, because I think that's the core of shame, and that's how, or the core of adult shame, and we build on this kind of negative affect, the structure of this negative affect to get to adult experiences of shame. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> to motivate the first suggestion, we will need to return to a theoretical assumption briefly elaborated in chapter one, 
about disposition about our dispositional nature of about the dispositional natures of social animals. Okay, so we take our cue from Rochet, who writes, "The tendency to approach others is what drives social animals at their core. From this core derives the basic fear of losing social proximity, a deep and universal anxiety about getting separated, or even worse, at least in humans, the anxiety of being actively rejected by others." Okay, so that's kind of a basic premise um, in my thesis, which is that as social animals, we are inclined towards behaviours and activities that draw us to others, right? and it's very, very painful for us to be in situations where we're excluded. Right? Yeah. The idea here is that social animals are, as a matter of biology, attracted to others of their own kind and are distressed when isolated from others of their own kind. In our own case, the thought is that humans are biologically compelled to interact with other humans, and the existence of this compulsion means that, at some primordial level, establishing bonds of accord with other human beings or being recognized as an object of interest or concern for others is desirable. Failing to establish such bonds is, owing to our social nature, intrinsically distressing. Okay, because that's what we're primed to do evolutionarily, because we are social creatures. Having in mind this characterization of social animals makes clear why awareness of a failure of matching behaviors leads to negative affect. Matching behaviors are exactly those behaviors that signal bond of accord, solidarity, or affiliation with others. And as social creatures, biologically primed to establish such interpersonal bonds, we are naturally distressed by the awareness that such bonds have been fractured or are absent. In other words, it is because of the kinds of creatures that we are biologically that an awareness of a breakdown of matching behaviours leads to a negative affect. Does that make sense? What's the time? Six minutes past two. I'm just going to finish this section and forget about the rest of it because it's too long. Yeah, I'm going to finish this section and not. Yeah, leave it. Okay. When it comes to offering a phenomenological district. When it comes to offering a phenomenological description of the affect resulting from an awareness of a breakdown in matching behaviours, we face a methodological challenge. We obviously, cannot solicit a we obviously cannot solicit a phenomenological description from the infant in the still face experiment. And while we can ask adults to describe their experiences uh, when similar breakdowns occur, uh, we cannot uncritically rely on those descriptions for two reasons. First, we're notoriously bad at putting words to feelings, um, and second, the adult description might include characterizations inappropriate to capturing the analogous experience of the infant, which is what we're interested in. So we propose, therefore, a phenomenological description based on structural features of the negative affect. Namely, we propose a phenomenological characterization deriving from what the negative affect is a response to, a response to namely the failure of matching relations. The characterization of the negative affect is therefore structural. Thinking in this way, we can think of the negative affect as a feeling of insecurity that reminds us of our dependence on others. So reminds is a bad word, but that's what I wrote. But it's bad because it's too cognitive. It's not a reminder. It's kind of a, a feeling of insecurity that is conditioned by our dependence on others rather than it reminds us. It is a feeling of, it is a feeling of insecurity because the subject becomes aware that she's not the recipient the recipient of concern or interest from another, and it's a feeling that reminds us of our essential dependence on others because the subject becomes aware that she's unable by her own efforts to get to a stage where she could be the recipient of concern or support. Okay, the latter point is crucial because it captures the central role of reciprocity. If the other does not reciprocate, matching behaviors are impossible. Our characterization of the negative affect experienced as a result of an awareness of a failure of matching behaviors can be recast more succinctly, if, less vague, if more vaguely, as a feeling of powerlessness, of dependency, or of vulnerability. Indeed, innumerable descriptive variations are available. Given our focus on providing a, phenomenolog a phenomenological description divorced from verbal reports and orientated towards key structural features of experience, what matters is that our phenomenological characterization captures the idea that an interpersonal relation that one relies upon to establish a bond of accord with others is lost, 
and the idea that you cannot repair that bond, one cannot repair that bond by one's own efforts. So in summary, our brief excursion into the negative affect experienced as a result of an awareness of the breakdown in matching behaviours leads to two conclusions. First, the awareness of breakdown in matching behaviours is intrinsically distressing for us because of the kinds of creatures that we are. And secondly, while we allow for multiplicity in the description of the phenomenology of this negative affect, each of these descriptions must in their own way capture the idea that the experience is negative and the idea that the experience is one that reminds us of our dependence on others, yeah, that's conditioned by dependence on others. So in section five, I mean, it starts, what has any of this to do with shame? But that's the part we're gonna miss out because we've been, I've been talking for too long. Um, Can you summarize uh, Basically, I think that at its core, shame is um, an emotion that is experienced when there is this fracture of this bond of accord. So I try to kind of basically establish a relationship between this earlier version and the later version, kind of a developmental trajectory, because often what you have is you have an account of shame at the adult level that I mean, you don't understand where it's from. It's kind of like what you wake up as an adult and you experience shame. It's not how it works, right? There are various structures that are established in childhood which we build upon I mean, it's like the developmental idea. We build upon, we add various kind of like cognitive factors. We add, you know, various complex buying factors. But I think that at its core, it doesn't change. It's this kind of, it's this need to be accepted, loved, you know, recognized, you know, which is even better, recognized by others. Um, and when that is broken, that's when you experience shame. So I just, I build on that. So this part is just kind of like, this is how infants experience it. Let's like let's tease out some kind of theoretical account there, and let's build upon it to explain adult experiences of shame. And that's section five. Cool. Th that's it. <laughs> Maybe I'll just moderate with questions so that you don't have to sort of hunt for um, hands at the same time that you're responding. Um, I have a couple questions, but questions from the audience first. Are there some? Yes. Um, so you describing like this lack of matching behaviour <laughs> being distressing or giving shame, and I wondered like if someone has experienced that uh, as a child, does it make it more difficult to receive matching behaviour if it does occur later? things about the, the psychological development of the child and also things about, you know, ad hoc things about their experiences and things. I mean, it's not, it doesn't necessarily kind of prohibit them from engagement with others. In fact, it might make them quite uh, like very Christian or puritanical or something. It might make them kind of desperate to please others and desperate to get kind of like recognition and acceptance for others. It just depends on the, the way that that individual kind of develops. And I think that's one of the challenges when we're thinking about something like shame and you're trying to conceptualize it because it is a universal experience, but it has so many kind of individual indi ways that make it kind of individual to that particular person. So it's almost kind of, if you, if you look at it from the perspective of the individual, it might make you think that there's no way we can theorize about this. There's nothing in general you can say about this because so much of it's contingent on <coughs> idiosyncratic things about your life, right? Um, so I think, yeah, that those features of your life are gonna shape your experience of shame in various ways, but there, are, there still are general things that we can say about its structure and its function. Yeah. So I was just waiting for you to mention the word narcissistic, yeah. because for me, the shame the, that we face when a child will end up as a narcissist uh, pathologic uh, disorder. Um, so when I relate pride for, for gay people, for example, I see as well like a narcissistic way to be validated, to be recognized and um, and uh, I think it's the kind of the, 
pride and shame, it works like a, a narcissistic uh, way to, to be as well in society and in relationship. And, uh, and I believe that uh, we, we, as a gay, as an artist, and as a child that grew up and in an environment where shame was constant, we, as an adult, that shame become our narcissistic way to behave in society, sometimes conscient, sometimes unconscient. And I think the pride is come a lot from this distorted way to, to be, so. Um. <clears throat> There's lots of stuff in like the psychoanalytic literature about the relationship between shame and narcissism. But I, I sort of think that, so you mean kind of an, an unhealthy concern with yourself, right? So that's, so being concerned with oneself isn't narcissistic, right? It's, it's kind of when it becomes unhealthy or when it becomes to the exclusion of others that it becomes something that we might recognize as narcissism. Um, so, for example, it becomes, you know, destructive for others, or it becomes destructive, destructive, destructive for the self, right? So, most people think that shame has, you know, some sort of essential kind of conceptual relation with the self, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a narcissistic self. And I actually want to try and move away from that narcissistic element. I think it's about our relation to others. Um, which kind of has something to do with itself, but has something to do with others as well. I, it's not an incredibly popular view, I guess, but I mean, I don't understand why it has to be a narcissistic concern with the self. It might just be concerned with the self that's born of the fact that we live in society and we want to kind of be able to engage with others in, in a way that makes us feel kind of secure and attended to and recognized. But there is a huge literature on this, and. There are lots of people who, who have made exactly the point you're making, which is like, you know, it's got this kind of tendency towards narcissism, narcissism and it becomes pathological in, in adult life. Loads of psychoanalysts have said that. It becomes pride. Can do. Oh, I, I just wondered, you were talking about when this, um, you know, you described this kind of distressing event and you said that this was, this was the beginnings of ideas around shame <coughs> and, the, and the occurrence of shame or, or the birth of shame, if you want to call it that. Um, but I was also wondering if it can be seen in another way as well, where that, when that happens, it reminds, it reminds the subject of its inherent need for sociality and bonding. So is that is it always inscribed as such a negative thing when actually it it can it could be something which actually reminds the subject of its inherent need and desire for community? Both those things can be true. I mean, both those things can be true. It can be. It depends how it's used, which is why I kind of. So it can be kind of a way of kind of. I think this is why shame is so prolific and I think it's why it's actually primordial. I, think I would say it's one of the basic emotions because it can be a way of kind of uh, fostering a sense of community. So you, you do what everyone else around you does, you know, and that's, that's your community. We do things in this way. It could be a mechanism by which you learn that, right? Or if for whatever reason, the community, there, there's something about you that the community doesn't like, or there's something about you that kind of makes you an easy target for the community, it could turn into this kind of extremely painful uh, desire for others to accept you that is not returned, it's not reciprocated, and then it becomes painful. So it could be kind of like a mechanism that's used positively to kind of foster senses of community, or it could be the alternative as well. It depends on various other things. So I think it could be both of the things that you're saying, basically, it just depends on other, other factors. I actually have a question. Um, I really thought this time? was. What was that? Do we have the time? 
Yeah, yeah, we've got, we've got some time. We've got some time. Uh, uh, we, you're not off the hook yet. Um, there, yeah, I, I think in so many discussions of shame, we take for granted that we know what shame is. And you know, we focus on what sort of social behaviors or interpersonal behaviors produce shame, what sort of things replicate a sense of shame, um, and we sort of assume we know what shame is. And so I really appreciated your attempt to kind of go back to the origins of what shame is about in terms of some kind of broken communicative link. What struck me was your emphasis on the idea of a negative origin. Shame is about not feeling reciprocation. Um, and I was forced to think about, or you know, I thought about some of the other ways we've been talking about this earlier this morning. I think it was Matthew who used the example of you know, a child who gets too close to the fire and the parent says, stop it, don't go there. And the shame is not about a communication that's cut off, it's about a communication that is unexpected and sort of breaks in on a behavior where the child thought everything was fine. And then I'm also thinking about the video with which we started um, and the examples of standing on the street corner uh, and you know, somebody throwing a milk carton at you. Uh, completely unexpected, you think everything's fine and suddenly somebody yells something at you and throws a milk carton at you. Those are not negative experiences, they're, they're aggressive interventions. And so I was wondering if you had any thoughts about this, about you know, could, could we say that, is there a temporal thing here that when we talk about the origins, the sort of infant origins um, in terms of you know, relations with our caregivers, that um, the originary sense of shame is about a negative experience, about a non-reciprocation, and then later in life it somehow becomes something that people use as a weapon because we already know what shame is? Or do you think, I, I guess I'm just asking about, if you think that that distinction between shame as originating in a broken communication, in a negative act, and shame in an aggressive communication, which is say an, 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 an you know, aggressive act, um, what's the relation between those, do you think? Um, well, uh, well, <laughs> Um, okay, so I think you're talking about two different things, and I think I would disagree with the example uh, earlier on, which is that kind of telling the child not to go by the fire is an example of some sort of primitive form of shame. I don't think that it is. Um, so there are various ways that we kind of educate children, like that involves kind of like reprimanding various things that, that aren't shameful. I don't think that shouting at the child who's going to jump off a, you know, you know, jump into the fire, that's not teaching the child about, I mean, it doesn't have the right kind of uh, structure for me, and the structure is exactly what, what you were talking about, which is, or what I've been talking about, which is kind of that this breakdown in communication, or this breakdown that kind of suggests to you that you're no longer an object of concern. You're, I mean, it, it's a breakdown that forces you to reflect on a fracture between you and, and society, or you and another, or, or whatever, and eventually you and yourself, right? So once you get older and you kind of like develop various kind of like psychological structures that attach to this primary experience, it can be a breakdown with others that forces you to think about your relationship to yourself rather than, or fractures your relationship with yourself rather than fracturing your relationship to, to others. So, um, so that's the first thing. I don't think that the going into the fire example is an example. Of and the second thing is, well, when you talk about people throwing milk partners at you and you're we you talk about shaming and shame, it's different. Shaming is something that people do to you, and that's kind of has a relationship to the experience of shame that you have, um, that, that an individual has, uh, but it's a, it has a different structure. It has a different kind of like intentional structure. Um, so they're just different. They are related, but I think they're, they're kind of different things. So I wouldn't put them together in the question the way that you did, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, that, that answer sounds like me. Um, yes. Hey, thanks, that was uh, really interesting and definitely not boring, so yeah, keep going. Um, this may be a question that you probably can't answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Um, you spoke about a methodological issue um, in terms of a phenomenological description of shame, um, particularly with adults in terms of we can't, um, I don't really like this word, but I'm gonna use it anyway, objectively uh, rely on sort of the oral histories and oral accounts of shame um, through sort of various reasons that you explained. Um, and I was thinking this is sort of in connection to the fact that um, 
humans in terms of our language and in terms of we can't escape metaphors. So whenever whenever you know anyone talks about sort of emotional feeling, it's related to the body. So you know you're heartbroken or you've been stabbed in the back, any etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there a way around this, particularly like thinking about this this audience and thinking about like the connection between queerness and shame and pride and all of these discussions that's been going on? Do you think there's a methodological way in which we can sort of circum navigate the potential issues around relying on oral accounts and going sort of circum you know using them but then also sort of finding other ways to to navigate how to explore shame um, i don't know that um i 100 percent understand the question so uh so, it's not that I don't think that you can never rely on verbal accounts, right? So who knows you better than, in a sense, who knows you better than you? But then there's another sense in which we lie to ourselves all the time. It's really hard to be honest with yourself and it's really hard like, to identify um, all of your emotions. You might think that you do, you might say certain things that kind of just accord with the narrative that you tell yourself, like be are notoriously bad at this, especially when it's something painful, when it's something that involves some kind of uh, problem with you, right? So we're notoriously good at telling ourselves stories in which we're the heroes, you know? Um, so it's not to say that we need verbal reports, of course, like that's how therapy works and therapy works, but we need to kind of, in some cases, interrogate our verbal responses with the understanding that we frequently tell ourselves stories to make ourselves feel better even stories about the way we actually feel about things, right? We might be embarrassed about our kind of reactions to things, you know? And then you tell yourself a story about why that's the case and it kind of subtly, by, by labeling it in a different way, um, it, subtly, it subtly changes things, right? So I just think you have to be, of course, yeah, you take verbal reports seriously, but you have to kind of understand what we do is kind of the kind of creatures that we are and in some cases kind of like interrogate um, you don't doubt people's authenticity I don't think that people are liars I just think it's difficult in some cases and the final question it kind of follows on really about trying to find some sort of objective basis in um, the pursuit of intellectual knowledge um, and, the, and the limitations of language, but I'm quite interested in the concept of institutional shame, and institutions actually, um, you know, having some way to to take responsibility and measure. Um, and it, I'm, my question is, I guess, do you think the work in psychoanalytical fields of study might provide some sort of qualitative or quantitative basis for institutions to? to um, have, have a, a measure of, of their own shame and... That's really interesting because psychoanalysis doesn't really deal with uh, the self as a collective. Does, I mean, it doesn't deal with like institutions. So you can have like, talk about UCL, you know, in the subject position, right? But psychoanalysts and analysts, analysts, really, they deal with the psychological, the ego, the self as a kind of a psychological entity rather than the self as this kind of like, other kind of structure, I guess. So, I'm sure I'm sure there's lots of kind of stuff that's applicable with within psychoanalysis, which you know, deals with the person, you know, with psychology that can be applied to kind of institutions. I think that's it's a really interesting question, actually. This will be the final question. Okay. Hi. Um, I think there's uh, two things really. One, firstly, um, if you look at Tom Kim's work on ideoaffective ideology. He starts to look at how ideology works in terms of shame manifestation, and I think that that might be an interesting um, development of your of looking how society, in fact, informs us. In terms of the queer stuff, um, if you look at um, Munoz's work on disidentifications, I think that that he works from the idea of um, interpolation and subjection. And I think that his work is really interested as a queer to, to be looking at shame. And that book specifically is an introduction into that. I think his work is really useful for me. I love that. I'll have to look at, look at that. Oh. Okay.
Okay, then um, I think we'll, we'll round up this, and thank you very much, because you carried the whole hour of your own.